I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for giving me an opportunity to do a virtual presentation today. I'll be speaking about CE marking for artificial intelligence devices. My perspective on this topic comes from my role as the VP Clinical Regulatory and Quality Affairs at MaxQAI. Uh, we have a device marketed as a Scipio IX, uh, which was granted a CE mark in May 2018. It's an AI-based prioritization tool for intracranial hemorrhage uh, on CT, uh, and it's integrated into radiological information systems, provides a flag that allows a system to uh, prioritize or otherwise route a, a case where uh, intracranial hemorrhage has been found. In other countries, this is still in, currently an investigational device, although it's the first in a broader portfolio, which will include annotation and diagnostic rule out of intracranial hemorrhage. To begin speaking about the CE system, it's worth thinking about the, the CE marking system in general. Currently, it's a system that's really in transition. Um, I've listed some of the major documents, um, references for, that underlie this system, and just beginning with the medical device directive. Um, this is a directive that's been around for a number of years, um, but is now in the process of being phased out. Uh, the phase out will take through 2024. It's being replaced at this time by the medical device regulation, um, which began phasing in, uh, in in this year and will continue phasing in through 2020. Fundamentally, the biggest difference between these two uh, systems is that the, the MDR is really much more of a life cycle approach. Um, and it has much, a much stronger clinical focus uh, on, on data. At the same time, there are a number of critical standards that underlie quality systems for device development. Um, ISO 13485 is probably the most important of these, and it is also undergoing a change with mandatory change from into the 2016 version uh, by February of 2019. Some of the critical changes in the 2016 version of 13485 include a requirement to validate QMS software, a uh, new structure for tec technical documentation, uh, new requirements around complaint handling, and new requirements around competence and training of staff. At the same time, the other main standard that is important for medical devices is ISO 14971. Um, this is a standard that has been in some for some time, but a new draft of this, of this standard is also expected in late 2018 or the beginning of 2019. Um, similarly, there are a couple of new regulations and directives that are coming into effect that are not specific to medical devices, but also have an impact on the medical device space. The General Data Protection Regulation uh, came into effect in May 2018, and it's really a paradigm shift in personal data management, um, both in medical devices and, and internet data in general. Um, in addition, there's a new cybersecurity directive from the European Union um, that is beginning to take effect, and it also specifies many, uh, many new preventive measures and reporting requirements for cybersecurity. Finally, the notified body space itself has really changed over the last few years. Um, following the PIP scandal a number of years ago, there's been increased oversight of notified bodies. Um, in addition, as the space moves toward the, the MDR, the medical device regulation, not all of the existing notified bodies are transitioning to MDR. Um, furthermore, some of the ones that are transitioning to MDR are changing in scope. And finally, there are a number of notified bodies that are located in the UK who may or may not continue their, uh, their activities following Brexit. Not only the framework for regulation, but the devices themselves are changing. Um, as evidenced by this session, CE-marked AI devices only began to, appear, began to appear on the market in the last couple of years. The first approvals were only announced in 2017. When we think about characterizing a medical device, this is true for medical devices in general, but even more so for software devices, and especially more so for AI devices, the first step to take is to consider whether software is actually a medical device. Under the existing medical device directive, it needs to have what's known as a medical purpose, capable of appreciably restoring, correcting, or modifying physical function, physiological function in human beings. Now, when it comes to things like decision support or diagnostic aids, so those are likely to meet the medical purpose definition. However, devices that are designed to develop knowledge about a disease or predict 
risk or disease predisposition may or may not fall under that category. Um, this is changing somewhat when, as we transition to the MDR. The MDR is specific about including software used for any purpose that's covered by MDR's definition of a medical device. In addition, accessories are more likely to be considered devices compared to in the MDD. Also, prediction and diagnosis is specifically included in the MDR criteria for medical devices. At the same time, software that's, that's used for general administrative purposes, even in healthcare settings, is exempted from definition as a medical device within the MDR. Assuming a piece of software is a medical device, the next step is classification. Standalone software is typically considered an active device under the MDD. It's interesting to note that software classification isn't, isn't intrinsically affected by the presence of AI versus traditional data methods in either the MDD or the MDR. In the MDD, it's more likely to be an accessory. However, in the MDR, there's a new rule, Rule 22, which may impact AI devices. That rule says active therapeutic devices with an integrated or incorporated diagnostic function which significantly determine patient management. That may mean that a lot of AI devices, um, which under the MDD may not have been considered medical, medical devices, are now considered devices. In addition, when thinking about the development cycle of a device, one key feature of AI devices is that many of them can employ continuous learning. An AI device can be capable of learning from its errors, of incorporating new data as, uh, as new data becomes available to it from use in the clinical space. This raises a number of issues for medical device development. First of all, it raises a theoretical issue of diverging versions in different customer sites, which is a, a quality and monitoring uh, challenge. But more fundamentally, the classic software development cycle in IEC 62304, the software development life cycle, assumes defined cycles of development and testing, development testing. If we were to think about this with an evolutionary uh, analogy, the AI devices are capable of phyletic gradualism, whereas uh, the, the 62304 standard really assumes punctuated equilibrium. One factor that can be overlooked by manufacturers in, in the development of AI devices is usability. AI devices are often capable of employing automatic processing. The impact of this may range from being minimal to major. On one hand, device actions may not eas be easily discernible to the user. On the other hand, at the other extreme, they could impact standard of care workflow in a significant way. The regulatory impact of these is that even minimal interfaces still require usability testing under EN 62366. But at the same time, extensive changes in, in workflow may trigger requests for substantial usability validation. An additional factor which I mentioned at the outset is the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. This is a fundamental change in data rules for EU companies and EU source data. It has been in effect since May 2018. A number of issues which could come up under the GDPR include issues such as the software data space. There are different requirements for what are defined as data controllers versus data processors. In addition, consent can be a large issue. AI devices often rely on large data sets, and it may be challenging to obtain consent from large groups of, of individuals whose data is being used. In addition, GDPR requires notification. That means notification of how the data is going to be used. And often in AI development, it's not clear at the outset how, the data is going to be, how that data is going to be used. In addition, there's the factor of explanation. GDPR requires the availability of explanation of decisions based on automated processing. While a manufacturer can, ex can explain how an AI system was trained, the manufacturer may not have insight into the AI decision process itself. In addition, the GDPR includes the right to be forgotten. Under this right, manufacturers may need to be able to local localize and remove subject data that was used in a training system. An additional factor that comes up in the development of software devices in general and AI devices in particular is cybersecurity. 
The MDR includes several new essential requirements on cyber issues or related issues. For example, IT security, interoperability, and mobile platforms. However, the EU Cybersecurity Directive is not specific to medical devices, and there's no harmonized EU standard for lifecycle cybersecurity for medical devices in the EU. Therefore, what many manufacturers do is they adopt the FDA standards with agreement of their notified body. Finally, at the outset, we mentioned notified body considerations. As we mentioned, there are fewer notified bodies available. Um, not all of them have scope for software devices. And not all notified bodies have auditors who are well versed in AI and software related regulations. Sometimes during an audit, this requires additional explanation or additional um, background for the auditors. One potential enabler in this space is that some notified bodies are including um, expedited review cycles. These are well suited to software devices and AI devices in particular because there's limited facility and manufacturing processes and there are really no biological issues such as biocompatibility. So where does all of this leave us? Over the next few years, I think we can all expect to see quite a few more AI products entering the market. And as these products enter the market, regulators will become more familiar and will adapt their auditing processes and assessment processes to these types of products. But at the same time, we in industry, I'm sure, will keep pushing the envelope and in innovating and challenging. Thank you.